Hey, well, hello, everybody. Great to see you. Welcome. Glad you are here. Hey, we celebrate three high holy days around real life, Christmas, Easter, and NFL kickoff, and it is this weekend, baby. Uh, so I, I'm wearing my, my shirt. I've even got, are you ready? Zoom in on this. The socks. That's right, baby, because we are, uh, we are going back and taking that title back. So uh, I don't know if you Raiders fans even know the NFL season's begun. It's been a few years since you've been relevant. But anyway, um, it's just a, it's a fun weekend, and uh, we're excited about that, excited about all things around here at Real Life. And here's one thing that I know about every single one of you, whether you're in the room, whether you're outside, or you're watching online, all of us like to succeed, okay? All of us like to win. And that's why this day, this weekend, is all exciting for anybody who's an NFL fan because your team right now has a chance, most of them, okay? But right now, you are, you know, zero and zero. You might be able to win this first game and feel like this is our year, this is our year, this is our year. Because we all, we all like to do things where we feel like we win. <clears throat> and you might be somebody who's highly competitive or somebody who's not competitive at all, but all of us like to know that we succeeded at things. For instance, if you are still playing sports or maybe you're a student athlete and you are playing sports, you want to win. If it's at work, you want to get the promotion. If it's at home, you know, you want to keep the marriage together. If you're in school, maybe your idea of success is a 4.5 and lots of scholarships or just passing, okay? You just want to pass and get through it. With your kids, you want to win to the point where they like you well enough when they leave, they want to come back home once in a while, you know? Not all the time, but once in a while to return. With your friends, you want to win in such a way that they like you and they want to be around you. You. All of us have different things in our life that we say like, I want to win at that. And so for some of us, that idea of winning can really push us to some bad areas where we just kind of run all over people. And then there's some other ways where we don't really pursue it enough and, and we get kind of weirded out by it and we just stay away from it altogether. Well, here's what I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about how Jesus tells us how you can win how you can succeed, how you can uh, have the, the victory in what it is that you're doing. And it's going to sound a lot different than what you might have expected. And it's going to be a lot more easier to achieve than what you think it might be. And if you're still new, kind of checking this thing out, you're not even sure where you are, where you are with Jesus right now, this is kind of a, you get to look in and see what Jesus is talking about and see if you want in. But if you if you're a follower of Jesus, this is an all skate. We're all in on this. This is what he has called us to do and what we're supposed to be about. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, so I want, to, I want to show you some pictures here, some, some famous uh, TV characters, and all of them have a catchphrase with them. Let's see if you can identify them. Here's the first one. This is Joey from Friends. How you doing? That's right. Okay. All right. This is Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Okay, that's his. What about Sheldon from Big Bang? Okay, Bazinga, exactly. And then my favorite that I grew up with, Arnold from Different Strokes. What you talking about, Willis? Okay. Now, this is, this series that we're walking through is the equivalent of what you talking about, Jesus. Okay, because what Jesus is saying in this series that we're walking through and breaking down was shocking then and still shocking today. Now, Jesus said a lot of things that we like. These are the things that we have put on, you know, uh, T-shirts and bumper stickers and, and uh, you know, crocheted pillows and those kind of things. Things like love one another or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or I go and prepare a place for you. We love those phrases. But then Jesus said some things that a lot of us just don't like. And we don't talk about them very much. Things like, I'm the only way to the Father. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Whoever follows me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We don't like those phrases. Those kind of mess up our lifestyles. Well, today we're going to look at a few statements that Jesus made, one in particular that was as shocking then as it is now when it comes to how do you succeed in life. And these are the kind of things that made people back then and today still say, what you talking about? 
And so we're walking through this series, What If Jesus Was Serious? And here's kind of the scene. Jesus has started having all these people follow him, and it's time for him to kind of give the State of the Union address and explain what he's all about to outline his mission, vision, values, those kind of things. And he is talking to people that are so, so exhausted with the way that they've been treated and the way that they've been living because of Roman oppression on their life. And so Jesus walks up on this mountainside and he sits down and he starts speaking these words of truth and everybody's kind of leaning in to hear what he has to say. And one of the guys who's there is a guy by the name of Matthew and Matthew writes these things down. And years later, they got compiled together with other books and became the New Testament attached to the Old Testament, which we now call the Bible. And in these, we have what's called the Beatitudes, or these first eight statements Jesus makes about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And these statements didn't fit in in the first century, and they don't fit in in this century, but they do fit into what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. So let's just catch up right here on what we've been talking about. Now, here's kind of the setting. Now, Jesus is walking along. He decides to sit down. He went up on this mountainside, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so over the past couple of weeks, we did a deep dive on each of those first two statements. And hopefully you've been with us for every single weekend. If you've missed one, catch up online. Hopefully you've been following the podcast, Real Life in Five, where we take five minutes to drill a little bit deeper on each one of those for five days in the week. Hopefully you're in a community group and you're talking about these things together. And today we're going to drop the third one that he says. And it's chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, let's look at that first statement right there, the very first part of it. Blessed are the meek, okay? Now, every time you hear the word meek, it's probably almost always a negative response you have to it. I mean, nobody says, you know what? When I grow up, I want to be meek. No dad says to their daughter, you grow up and find yourself someone meek. That's what you do. No, we say you grow up and find someone with a job. That's what I need you to do, right? I don't want you living under my roof. I mean, we, we never really affirm this as something that we want, but The actual meaning of this word is gentle and humble and considerate. But then if you look at the word the way that Jesus used it, Jesus doesn't even mean exactly just those words. It's even more than those words. In fact, if you look at it in the ancient Greek, uh, it means a little bit more. In fact, I had a seminary professor give me this lesson. So this is your seminary lesson for the week. Meek is not weak in the Greek. Okay, there you go. Just rhymes, flows off the tongue, and if it rhymes, we know it's true. So let's all say that together wherever you are, even if you're in Starbucks watching this or sitting outside. Meek is not weak in the Greek. There you go. You've been to seminary. Congratulations, everybody. Saved you $50,000. All right. Now, this idea, (laughs) this idea is bigger than just being gentle and humble. That's a big part of it. The actual phrase being used here is like a bridled horse, tremendous strength under control. Someone who has all the power and all the strength and the ability to drop the hammer on somebody, but they don't use that. It reminds me of a football coach, Tony Dungy. He wrote a book called Quiet Strength, which is another phrase for meek. And Tony Dungy coached for many, many years, won a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning, And during those years, he would always start off his first team meeting at the beginning of every season talking simply in this tone, fellas, you will never hear me talk louder than this. I'm not going to scream at you. I'm going to communicate with you. That was his disposition. Did he have the power? Did he have the authority? He had been a football player. He knew what it took, but he had quiet strength. I think about another football player. Mike Singletary, who played for the Chicago Bears, Kevin Finkbeiner's Chicago Bears, who won back in 85. We've won since then, goodness, 85. And Singletary was known as the most feared person on the field. But on Sundays, he held babies in his church's nursery. This is a guy that had all the strength, but knew how to hold it back. That's meekness. Meek is not weak. 
Meek is being able to turn the other cheek. Meek is able to control your anger with your spouse. Meekness is when you have the chance to get even, but you choose not to. You see, we kind of get that, and we want other people to be that. We just don't want to do that. And so Jesus gives you a reason to do it. And here's the next phrase. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, what is that all about? I mean, you take a look at some of these Beatitudes, and they have these great kind of promises with them. Blessed are those who mourn, they're going to be comforted. The merciful, they'll be shown mercy. But inherit the earth. What does that actually mean? Well, Jesus is, is kind of hearkening back to something that was written about 900 years before him by a king by the name of David, who, and Jesus is in his lineage. And David wrote this song that was recorded in his prayer journal, which was kind of compiled together, and it's called the Book of Psalms. And he says this in this context, and Jesus is using this as his statement. All the things Jesus just said are in this statement. Let me read this to you, Psalm 37. It says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, there it is again, will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, why is the land such a big deal? Because I want you just to kind of imagine the other side of the world and this piece of land we refer to as the Middle East, specifically Israel. This is kind of the, where we believe the Garden of Eden was, somewhere in that region. And after sin happened, Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And it's like pretty much all of humanity spent the rest of their time trying to get back to this promised land. Though they weren't really sure of the location, they wanted to be where God wanted them to be. And so along comes this guy named Abraham, and he's promised by God, I'm going to give you land. And then it goes down to his son and his son and passed down. And eventually they find this land and then they get overtaken by, by uh, Egypt. And then along comes Moses and he gets his people out of slavery. And now they're making the march to that land. And eventually they get the land back after 40 years. And God tells them this in Deuteronomy. He says, if you obey me, you can keep the land. But if you disobey me, the land will be taken from you. And that's exactly what happened. They went through several generations of disobedience to God, and God finally said, I've had it. And he allowed Babylon to come in and overtake them, and then Syria to come in and overtake them, and then eventually Rome to come in and overtake them. And all the while, they had lost their land. And so for the past several hundred years, the people of Israel were asking, when do we get our land back? And so out of that came four groups of people that said, I know the way, follow us. We'll get the land back. And so these were the four groups. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. Write that down, there will be a test, okay? <laughs> Who are these people? Well, they all took different approaches of how to get the land back. The Pharisees, here's how you remember them. They're just not fair, you see, okay? It doesn't get any better. That's just, okay. The Pharisees believed that if our disobedience to God got us into this mess, then we're going to be extra obedient, obey every law and all the extra laws in order to get God's attention, and that will get us our land back. But all they were doing was just following religious rules, and they had no heart for God. Then there were the Sadducees, and they're just sad, you see. And so what the problem, <laughs> I told you, it doesn't get any better, uh, but that is the last one. Uh, the Sadducees were realists. They just simply said, you know what? We can't beat the Romans. Might as well join them. And they compromised all of their values because of the power of the day. Then there were the Essenes. The Essenes were separatists. They just said, we don't want any part of it, and they just withdrew. 
Okay, they just got out of town. They just, <laughs> they just moved to Texas or Idaho or Arizona or Nashville. No offense to those of you that are moving, but oh my goodness, I'm praying. All right, anyway, so they, y'all are leaving us. But anyway, they, the, the Essenes just moved away and they got out of town. They said, we don't want any part of this. But then there were the zealots. And the zealots said, we're not going anywhere. We're going to kill every Roman we see. And every now and then there would be these political uprisings where they would go after the Romans and try to wipe them out. That's your four groups. And Jesus is talking to these oppressed people, saying, God's kingdom, it's not about just obeying rules. It's not about alliances or withdrawing or overthrowing. In my kingdom, the meek who have all the power but withhold it, they inherit the earth. Now, did you notice the difference there? He didn't say land. It's bigger than just the Middle East. It's the earth. Because the kingdom of Jesus is bigger than the kingdom of Israel. It's the kingdom that he is forcefully bringing into the world. As Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, Jesus has come to bring a new kingdom with different values. I told you we've been using this book, What If Jesus Was Serious, to kind of give us some great images. And he's got this great picture in there of how this kind of looks. You can kind of see here this one way the zealots were taking is the way of power, outrage, aggression, violence, coercion, domination, lies, and division. Pretty much social media. Our righteous goals justify our means, and they're going after They're going after the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus says, no, it's actually the way of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, the meek. When they go low, we go high. That's what it means to be part of my kingdom. Jesus uses this word one other time. Matthew's there for this one as well. He records it in his gospel. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. These are the same words that he uses for meek. Jesus himself was gentle and humble in heart, but he was not cowering in fear. Jesus was not afraid of the Romans. Jesus was not afraid of the religious leaders. And Jesus was not afraid to lay down his life. So what does it mean to be meek? What does it mean for us to be gentle and humble in heart? Well, Jesus tells this classic story that we've alluded to a few times in this series where he talks about these two guys go into the temple. And and I want to read it for you in its entirety, but this is what he says. Uh, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So we have two characters in this story. We have the Pharisee, remember we've already talked about them, and they're just religious um, uh, rule abiders, and they just uh, feel like that's the way they're going to get God's attention. And then there's the tax collector. And don't think just IRS agent. Think Bernie Madoff. Okay, that's what they were like. They had swindled everybody out of their money. And every now and then, one of them would come to a realization of what they'd done. Well, Jesus says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. The robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector, kind of pointing at him across the church, right? I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. I mean, the Pharisee basically turns around and he says, God, I want to give you thanks, which seems good, right? But I want to give you thanks that I'm not like that guy. God, I'm, I'm just, I want to start off by thanking you for a few things, and I want to thank you that I'm better than everybody else. I want to thank you that you've allowed me to be a Chiefs fan and not a Raiders fan. You know, just little things like that. Have I picked on you all too much? I'm sorry, all right? But what he's saying here is, this guy is so full of himself. And I read that, and I think, I would never pray like that. I would never pray like that. God, thank you that I would never pray. Thank you, but I'm not like that guy. And then I think, I just prayed it. That attitude is exactly what Jesus is saying, is not meek, it's not humble, and it's being full of pride. Now, I know 
that most of us would never say phrases just like that. But there are other phrases that we do use. There are phrases like, you aren't going to talk to me that way. And we take our power, whether it's from our religiosity, whether it's from our education, whether it's from our amount of money or status we have, and we look down on somebody else and we say, I can't believe you would ever think you have the right to speak to me that way. Now, I don't know what it is. I have something that is itching my nose, and I'm so sorry, but it's just got to happen, so I'm going to get it over with. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, th- let me just talk about this phrase for a second, because I don't, goodness gracious, it's like there's a fly. I don't think it's a COVID symptom. I hope not, but anyway. <laughs> I had this experience. You never know what you're going to get on Thursday night. I had this experience um, a-, a few months ago. My family and I, we were in, we were in Florida, and uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of Florida because of the humidity, but we have a friend in Kentucky that had a timeshare there and said, go take the timeshare. So we went down there and I got a big Suburban and we all piled in it. My in-laws are with me. Did I fail to mention that? <laughs> so anyway, we all, we all drive down there um, with a lot of people telling me how to drive uh, down to Florida. And they all pile into the timeshare, and the timeshare happens to have a garage, a very small one-car garage, and I got this huge old Suburban, but I am, you know, I'm a guy, so I think I can park anything and drive anything, so I, I'm, I'm to the point now where I'm backing into it easily with inches to spare on each side of those side mirrors, just <laughs> flying in there, you know, and people are walking by like, wow, that's incredible. I know, I know, exactly. And so one day I'm doing this, and I've been doing this for almost a week now, and I'm backing it in, and a guy walks by, and he stops, and he's just staring at me. And I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, do you need me to guide you in? And I'm thinking, move along, I got this. It's just this little exchange guys have with each other, like... And so this is going on, and he's still staring at me, and I'm thinking, he won't, leave, he won't let it go. Are you kidding me? I got this. And I'm backing up, and of course, I got the, back cr- the camera as well, which is helping me quite a bit. And so I'm going back, I'm going back, and I'm feeling really confident, and suddenly this guy runs up and starts banging on the hood and looking at me going, and I'm thinking, what in the world? It's go time. I'm getting, if I could get out of this thing in the garage, you know, and I look up, And I am inches from just removing the side view mirror because I've gone in crooked. (laughs) Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. God bless you. You know, it's just this, I can't, it's just so bad to be corrected and then that person to be right. Have you ever had that experience? That's what this is all about. That's me going, don't you dare talk to me like that. And we all do it, myself especially. Here's another one. I'm not going to apologize. (sighs) They're the ones that need to apologize. I'm going to take all of my strength and power, which could restore the relationship, and I'm saying nothing. Here's another one. It's not me. It's you. Now, I know we say it the other way when we're breaking up with somebody. It's not you. It's me, right? But in this case, if they would make the changes, if she would just do this, if he would just do this, then we'd be okay. But that doesn't describe gentle and humble. Here's another phrase. You know, it's just not fair. How come they get that and I don't? Here's a clue. If you have a hard time celebrating with others when something good happens to them, you're probably struggling with a little bit of pride. Here's another one. But what about? In other words, maybe I'm wrong, but they're more wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have, but you know what they did. And we're taking our position and our power, and we're saying, I'm okay. They're the issue. And Jesus continues with this story. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. And he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And actually, in the original language, it says, the sinner. The Pharisee stands up and draws attention to himself. The tax collector stands at a distance. 
The Pharisee elevates himself as a righteous man. The tax collector only elevates himself as the worst sinner. Who was gentle and humble and considerate? And Jesus says, the meek will inherit the earth. He continues on and he says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all he chose, who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, here's what's so interesting for you and me. It's easier to be a rule keeper. It's easier to check all the boxes. It's easier to do all those things than it is to check your heart. But when you look at the upside-down kingdom of Jesus, it's those who humble themselves that will be exalted. It's the poor in spirit that get the attention of God. And it's those that are humble in heart that will inherit the new kingdom. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, we are saying may up there be down here. Would your values in heaven be here on earth? Would your will be done here just as they are there? And Jesus says, you want to win at life? The meek inherit the earth. Not the weak, but the meek who know they have power and strength and resources, but they choose to use it to benefit others, not to oppress them. So let me ask you this soul-searching question that you can kind of think about. I gave you four groups of people. Who do you most easily identify with? The Pharisees, who think just more religion will make it better. The Sadducees, who are just compromising their values. The Essenes, who just want to withdraw and put their head in the sand and figure nothing's happening. Or the Zealots, who want to just take up arms and go to war. If any of those describe you at all, Jesus is saying it's not the way to inherit the earth. The way you get the kingdom that I offer is we go high when others go low. The meek inherit the earth. So I have a few questions for you to talk about with your community group or maybe just with people in your family on the drive home, with people you're with right now watching online. First one is this, and you might want to just take a screenshot of this just so you can, uh, you know, keep these close because they've got some words to them here. Why do you think our culture celebrates strength and power over humility and those who are meek? Do you know someone who exhibits that kind of controlled strength? And what are some ways that you can use your current power, influence, or position to benefit others? And you might think, I don't have any power or strength. All of us do. All of us have some kind of influence over somebody else. What if you use it to benefit them rather than just to benefit yourself? You see, an invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to unfollow yourself and to say, your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So I want to give you a chance to do that right now. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you are? I want you to think about your general way in which you respond to try to win at life. Maybe it's moral perfection. Maybe it's just compromise. Maybe it is withdrawing. Maybe it's war. But what if today you say, Jesus, I want to do it your way? Humble. Gentle, meek. And maybe you've never given your life over to Jesus yet, and you've heard about it, and you've talked about it, you've thought about it, but you've never said, I'm in. Would you just take that moment right now to say, Jesus, I want to follow you? I'm asking for your forgiveness. I'm asking for you to lead me. I want to follow you with all of these seemingly crazy statements, God. It's 
it's the way I want to live because every other way has failed me. Father, we come to you with our brokenness and our mistakes and the way that we have overpowered and used our strength against people and the way that we've waged war and compromised values. God, we just come to you and recognize we have done it all wrong. May we be known as people that have quiet strength and stand up for those who can't and use our power to help others. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.